And I'd like to introduce Phyllis Saarinen to introduce our session for today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for attending this first session of the program, a survey of Western Hemisphere archaeology. I put a few handouts uh, on the chairs by the aisle uh, to, help to help understand uh, what the discipline of archaeology is, because I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, but traditional classical archaeology was practiced by Victorian era Europeans focused on Egypt, the Eastern Mediterranean Bronze Age, and the Fertile Crescent. To some extent, it still does. So, for example, the study of ancient civilizations of Europe, the Eastern Mediterranean, and Asia is housed at the UF Classics Department, while the archaeology of the Western Hemisphere is researched and taught in the Anthropology Department. So what about the Western Hemisphere, the New World? Until the mid-1900s, European Americans could not imagine that there were pre-Columbian urban populations in North America besides maybe the Mayans and the Aztecs, and in South America before the Inca. In the 1800s and early 1900s, Euro-American archeologists, amateurs and artifact poachers couldn't admit that the indig indigenous people they hardly knew could have built the immense stone Olmec heads and pyramids of the, of the Mayans, the mound complexes observed in the Ohio River Valley along the Mississippi and scattered across the Southeast. Surely it was the lost tribes of Israel they wrote in the 1800s, or Egyptians or Polynesians who floated across the oceans to create the sophisticated settlements found in Central and South America. Remember Thor Heyerdahl and the balsa wood raft trips of the 1950s? There's a museum to him in Oslo. Are they, do they still believe his theory? Well, Professor Krigbaum today will enlighten us on the first Americans who they were and still are, and how they got here. Dr. Krigbaum is a professor in the Department of Anthropology and the director of the UF Bone Chemistry Laboratory. A paleoanthropologist, his specialty is stable isotope analysis, and I'm not gonna go into that because I don't know anything about it, of hair, bone, and tooth fragments revealing not only ancient diet, but also patterns of migration and geographic origin. He has conducted analyses of prehistoric remains of early indigenous peoples of North America, as well as Southeast Asia and Africa, he said at lunch. His studies have contributed significant information on human origins and even subtle differences such as diet associated with social class in ancient settlements. John has received numerous grants from the NSF as well as other sources and has published extensively. He earned his PhD from New York University. So Dr. Krigbaum, please. Thank you, Phyllis. And um, I have a pretty loud voice, but I'll try to direct it into the mic as well so that uh, people in Zoom land can, um, can get what I'm saying here. It's a real pleasure to be here today and to share with you some interests that I have, common interests in um, you know, the prehistory of, of the Americas. I am, as, as Phyllis mentioned, I'm a, bi I'm a biological anthropologist. I do some paleoanthropology. I do quite a bit of bioarchaeology. Uh, working with human remains from various archaeological sites uh, in the States, but also in other parts of the world. And I, um, I do run a lab. I run a chemistry lab. And ironically, I lean on the chemistry that I learned in college to uh, sort of help shepherd my, uh, my interests and in publications moving forward. It's, it's kind of crazy how uh, that sophomore chemistry class just keeps on coming back to me in terms of how we're changing the field uh, in archaeological science. Um, it is we at, at, over lunch we were talking about anthropology and how it's a uh, field of study that not only is a scientific field of study, 
uh, interested in the natural history of humankind, but um, it's also a humanities if you want it to be. It's a social science if you want it to be. It's kind of a jack of all trades discipline that um, we we as an anthropologist want everybody to sort of have feel welcome and and to learn from. And I always not you know you don't have to like anthropology, but um, I always would be like. Why wouldn't you like anthropology? You know what I mean? Um, it's so cool that we can, you know, an artist can construct a diorama like that uh, or a, a painting like that. Uh, this is uh, on the Osceola River, um, inspired by a 14 and a half thousand year old site uh, that was excavated um, back in the 60s. I think they had known about it and then. Um, future work continued there, and um, uh, colleagues from Florida State University have sort of recently published on the new dates at 14 and a half thousand years ago. Uh, so it's a workshop, it's uh, humans um, living on the landscape, butchering extinct megafauna, and uh, participating in, in lives not completely unlike our own, but very different from what we are used to today. Um, and so I thought I'd start with that, but um, I also wanted to make one um, important point. I, uh, my research agenda is not in first Americans. I, I, am, um, I am interested in it. And so when I, I said to, um, uh, to Phyllis that I'd, I'd be happy to give this talk, I realized, well, I've got some reading to do. But I also wanted to do that reading. And so I feel like I'm a good translator of what I've read. And I also feel that um, I, I'm an, an interdisciplinary enough um, person to be able to talk about just how interdisciplinary this, this uh, line of inquiry can be. So these are just a few notes, but um, as a, as a biological anthropologist, I had no idea that I would become interested in paleo-oceanography or paleoclimatology or dendrochronology or radiocarbon dating or, um, you know, palynology or, you know, you name it, animal behavior. All of these things can contribute to how we interpret human lives in the past. And so, in this, in this uh, lecture, we're gonna talk about the archeology span principally and these amazing archeological sites that are in the new world um, in the Western hemisphere. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the genetics findings that have been uh, happening and are increasingly informing um, aspects of what we know and what we don't know and what we simply can't know uh, through through our approach. And I'll talk very briefly about linguistics. I am not a linguist. I am, um, there is a field of study in anthropological linguistics. I am not one, but I do recognize that it's a part of that whole that we're interested in in terms of humanity. The other thing I think that's important to recognize about a, a, a storyline like the first Americans is that it's very newsworthy. When something and when an extraordinary find is, is broadcast, um, it really requires an ex extraordinary team of people and extraordinary science to sort of step up to the plate to demonstrate extraordinary claims. And so archeology span is all about argument. It's about, it's not about truth. It's just about making good arguments about the evidence that you have. And um, one of the things that's um, quite, um, humbling in a way is a lot of this work that I'm going to review and 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 the the hard work of thousands of people really um, is how um, how the the humility of it all in a way it's just that they're doing really good work and you can jump on YouTube and any of these sites that I mentioned today you can jump on YouTube and find videos and volunteers and people digging dirt and helping out and contributing to the science writ large. And yet at the same time, the caliber of work that's being done is as, as 
as equivalent to any other field of study you might encounter. Um, so just as paleoanthropology and, you know, analyses of early human remains from the, the um, Rift Valley in East Africa or something might require a really good, talented team of folks, the, the New World and the first Americans in the archaeology that's being um, conducted here is top notch, and we have a lot to be proud of. And there are a lot of people interested in it, and not just not just Americans, not just um, people um, like you and me. Um, indigenous peoples are interested in their own heritage and in their own history. And I think one of the improvements that have been made over the last few decades is increased collaboration with indigenous groups and communities, um, engaging with oral traditions um, and connecting uh, so that people can better understand the past and understand what it means. Um, so the, there are big questions, right? Who were these people that ended up being the first Americans? Um, what routes did they take to get here? And um, how did they live? And how did they um, interact? These are all big questions. And so we will try to address some of those uh, facets to those, but uh, we'll also... Uh, have to leave a, a, the, the jar half empty, uh, unfortunately, and, and it will continue to contribute. I think the science will contribute, continue to, to amass new data and debates will be resolved or not, and we'll know what we can know and what we can't know based on what we're digging up and what we're finding. <clears throat> These are two books I have not read yet, and I wish I had. But uh, these are very recent books, and they're um, the one on the left, The Genetic History of the Americas by Jennifer Raff. She's at the University of Kansas, and I read a book review of this in the New York Times not that long ago, and it was a very, very nice review. And so I really do want to get this book. I just don't have it yet. Um, but what she is, is she's a genetic anthropologist, and um, but she's stepped back and again with humility she's sort of explore it, it, diving deep into the archaeological record the linguistic record oral traditions and native communities and weaving together a story about the first americans that um is a compelling read or should be a compelling read so i look forward to reading that uh and then another is by a, a practicing archaeologist david meltzer who um, has been involved with a number of the sites we'll probably talk about today. And I started diving into his book a little bit, what I could get on the first edition online. And um, he writes really well and from an archeological point of view. And you realize that um, these, you, you just recognize that they, they it, it's not lost on them, the impact that these studies have. They're really important to understanding humanity and all its wrinkles. So there's a lot of research activity on this topic and it's it, it's sort of romantic in a way because modern humans uh, had evolved in Africa, they've gotten out of Africa, they've gone to new worlds in the old world, um, into uh, Asia and up knocking on to the door of Siberia uh, they went into Europe, they've gone into Australasia. And in the New World, when modern humans came into the New World, um, there were extinct megafauna still thriving in um, below the ice uh, in North America and South America. And many of these early sites have, um, you know, solid evidence of human habitation and human occupation. Are, and are associated with extinct faunas. So there's another debate that was um, uh, sort of quite in vogue uh, a generation or more ago about did early man in the new world make all these ex megafauna extinct? And there's no doubt that humans are effective hunters, but I think there's been a number of claims saying, oh, it might be disease, it might be climate change, it could be that they were just hunted to extinction. Um, but I think that 
humans are pretty smart too, and they, you know, they can um, manage animal populations as well as uh, and and nurture them as much as um, uh, sort of uh, benefit from their resources and things. So I don't know if that's necessarily why the extinct faunas uh, went away. But we're going to touch on this site. This is uh, from New Mexico and and uh, at the White Sands National Park, and we'll come back to this in a little bit. But I need to go into some um, some paleo oceanography type of uh, things first. And uh, this is just a graph from about 60,000 years to the present. And um, what this blue curve is are uh, isotope signals that are a proxy to sea level rise and fall. And um, the LGM that you see in the blue there, right here, oops, right here, that stands for last glacial maximum. And at conditions change over time. And sometimes it gets really cold and sometimes it gets really warm as we all know in Florida. And when things get really, really cold, um, ice water, including ocean ice, uh, locks up as glaciers. And so what we know occurred at the last glacial maximum is that these massive ice sheets in the northern latitudes were grew uh, to cover the entire country of Canada and so on. So it was a massive field of ice that was a mile high. And so it's unfathomable how much ice there was. And as modern humans would come into this part of the world, um, it's, they, they, there were some barricades, right? There were some obstacles in their way. And one of the big questions is, well, how did they navigate those obstacles of massive ice? And what we see is with the last glacial maximum, we, it, it extends over a period of about 7,000 or so years and sea levels uh, sort of are at their lowest extent and then they start to rise. And then as they rise, um, the oceans get, the sea levels get higher, about 130 meters higher than they are, than they were at their lowest extent. And uh, it changes the topography of everything around you. Uh, especially along the coast and along island settings. So who these people were is a big, big question. And uh, we know they're homo sapiens. We know, I've already mentioned this, they, they've they come out of Africa. They're in exploring and expanding into different parts of the old world. And we know that the people that came into the new world were ancestors of, uh, indig well, they're the ancestors of indigenous peoples, of the Americas today. If you do the math, there's over 2,000 indigenous groups in the Americas today, 2,034, I believe. And if, if, who's counting? But you know that's a lot of different groups of people. And um, this, was, uh, this, this image was uh, produced um, about 20 years ago, uh, and it in, it sort of reflects the diversity of people in these different parts of, uh, of North America and South America. And they, uh, it coincided, this, this coincided with scientific work by David Reich and colleagues at Harvard, who uh, had published a study on the genetics of living peoples in the Americas, principally in Canada and South America, for reasons I'll explain later. And um, basically it said, this paper 20 years ago, it supported a three pulse model into the new world. And we, we know that um, this first pulse, the main pulse was an Ameri-end Ameri pulse of people who shared a common mother tongue and uh, entered the new world at some point, we don't know when, and um, this was uh, this was supported by the genetics evidence that Reich and colleagues produced. And in interestingly, it got a lot of um, praise because it supported this fellow Joe Greenberg's uh, work. 
And he was a linguist who uh, studied big, big language groups. And um, he was vilified for a lot of his ideas um, for all sorts of reasons that I don't understand because I'm not a linguist. But I, uh, what was interesting is 20 years after his work uh, or even more, um, the genetics data supported his hypothesis of the peopling of the Americas in this three principal uh, groups of languages that came into the Americas, this Amerind uh, macro family and um, Eskimo Aleut uh, language groups and Nadine, which are Apache and Navajo type languages. So the language story is a really important one that I won't go into anymore but it's interesting that the genetics are starting to sort of mirror some of these ideas about the peopling of the shared languages that uh, have existed here. So this is basically spelling out this, these different ideas. And from a biological point of view, uh, we know that, okay, there are these uh, East Asians that are entering into the new world. Um, are they coming in one migration or multiple migrations? And we're this this new genetic evidence is supporting the multi migration idea. Now, this latter point down here with this Beringian standstill, this is a new hypothesis, a relatively new hypothesis, that suggests that maybe, just maybe, as people were coming into the new world, maybe they were hanging out up here for a little while before they truly entered into what we know as you know North America and South America. Maybe they were um, living up here for five or 10,000 years or so. And that's what's referred to as the Beringia standstill hypothesis. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. <clears throat> so back to paleo-oceanography. So we have these massive ice sheets and there are they come in two flavors. We have the Cordillera ice sheet here. And this is the Northwest coast and Southern Alaska. I'm gonna spin you around a little bit on the globe with some of these maps, I apologize. But, uh, and then we have the massive Laurentide ice sheet. And, um, and then of course in Europe there, it's got its own Arctic ice sheets going on. And we know that these sheets were merged Cordilleran and Laurentide were sewn together by ice a mile high uh, up to about 14,000 or so years ago. So when these, when with the warming and cooling, the, the interstadials, the um, warming events, these things would melt and apparently there'd be an inland opening that people might migrate down into um, North America. Uh, during those periods of time. That's a big part of this story is, was it an inland route into this into the new world or was it more of a coastal route hugging these uh, this area up here instead of cutting through here? So the timing of this opening and closing of this ice corridor is a really important um, element to it. And, um, we know now that it's about after 13.8 thousand years ago that that started to open up. Now, we also know that there's there are other ecological barriers other than massive glacial ice that might limit population movement. And um, we can see here that there are in this, so I've flipped you around now in the map and we're now looking at things more normally. And here's the Bering Land Bridge, here are the uh, Aleutian Islands and um, Alaska and into the Northwest Coast. And we see this massive land bridge that was uh, that is submerged today, but was exposed during these periods of low sea level. And What's really interesting is that people are starting to reconstruct the ecology of these uh, East Siberian Arctic shelf and this Bering Chukchi platform and are finding areas that would have been more um, consistent for human habitation and other areas that would be less 
conducive to human habitation. And they, they argue that uh, these areas up here would have been um, perhaps more conducive and these areas down here less conducive. Think, or yeah, so there's peak areas where there's low animal activity and uh, less likely uh, conducive to human sustenance, sustaining human populations. And then other areas where they're, um, they're likely to have been happy and, um, you know, might have stand still, but they may have been hugging those areas for a while. So this Cordillerian coastal route, uh, coastal corridor becomes a real feature in the story that we're, is going to unfold. And the reason it's, it unfolds this way is that, uh, again, the timing of that ice sheets and, and when they're open and exposed and when they're not, a new idea formed um, about eight years or so ago called the Kelp Highway Hypothesis. And maybe, just maybe, um, early humans coming into this part of the world had boats and they were, uh, well, we know they had boats because the only way humans would have gotten to Australia, for example, is by on, on a boat. You can't get to Australia in any other way other than a boat. And we know Australia got populated 55,000 years ago. So that's a fact. Um, so they probably, they could have had boats and hugged these, this Cordelleran uh, coastal highway. And as they did so, they'd they'd have access to these incredibly biodiverse um, ecosystems called kelp systems. And they, you know, not only is there these large algae blooms and algae uh, that you can sustain yourself on, you, you can eat forever and you, you'd be okay. Um, but there's lots of marine uh, seabirds and mammals and fish and things that would sustain um, human populations. So this kelp highway hypothesis is kind of considered the new route, or so I thought, um, and uh, that this, this traditional land route that I learned in college is now kind of like, eh, that's, that's too young. It's too recent. It's not really where all the action's happening. It seems like these, these, these coastal corridors is where all the action is. But then I started learning, and this was just a few days ago, I might add. <clears throat> uh, Summer Pretorius works at the uh, US Geological Survey, and she's collaborated with a number of uh, uh, archaeologists and geologists and paleo-oceanographers and, and people like that. And what they've been doing is saying, OK, well, maybe kelp, but what about sea ice? And what about? floating ice platforms that you could jump on and hang out with and actually skirt along the coast on these blocks of ice. So it's almost like you don't need a boat. You've got these blocks of ice and you can move from one block of ice to another. You're skirting the coast. You have plenty of food and you're able to uh, do it. But there's a problem because there are parts of this where it's, it's too early um, probably to, to happen. And then there are other times when uh, their modeling suggests it would be far too dangerous to, um, from freshwater runoff, it'd be far too dangerous to, um, to navigate those waters at those periods of time. So these, what, she's, what their team have done is uh, produce these different models of, uh, you know, around last glacial maximum and during uh, areas of deglaciation. And they've shown that there are particular points in time in these windows of time that are earlier than say 14, 15, 16,000 years ago that would fit pretty well with what we know in terms of the timing of the earliest modern humans in, in uh, the new world. So these are the points that are, you know, that need to be dealt with is these massive glaciers, these riptide ocean currents and sea ice conditions that can, can be prolonged and quite hazardous at times. 
So this notion of a sea ice highway is really fascinating. And um, just last month, she presented um, this, this paper at the AGU conference and I did a sea ice highway facilitate early human migration from Beringia into North America along the coastal route. And what I love about it is that it, it's, it's intuitive. It has a lot of modeling and builds on data that we know from um, just from sediment cores and, and other lines of paleoclimate evidence. And it also kind of can stitch together a lot of different kinds of information into a single elegant model. So this inland versus coastal sort of dilemma isn't so much a dilemma anymore. We know that there are sites along this interior coast area, but they all date to about under 14,000 years ago. And we now know there are sites in the new world that are older than 14,000 years ago. So if we're looking for the first Americans, we probably don't want to talk about an inland coastal route and we want to sort of start thinking about this, this all the co other coastal options. Now that brings us to stone tools. And if, if you, you're talking to, to anyone about the first Americans, it almost always goes to, well, what do the stone tools look like? You know, surely they are, they have Clovis point technology, which is this impressive flint napping skill to do something like that. This is not, um, this is a, a, a Gauguin, you know, these are, these are very, very good uh, flint nappers producing points of this caliber. These are called Clovis points. And there was this idea of a Clovis first hypothesis that surely no first Americans preceded these Clovis points. These Clovis points must have come in from, from elsewhere this technology was brought in, imported in a way, and uh, and that's how we have Clovis point technology. And when you find a Clovis site, you're dealing with the first Americans. And it's very, very well dated at 13.2 to 12.8 thousand years ago. Archaeological sites with excellent stratigraphic control have, you know, have constrained these dates to a very specific time frame. So if you're falling outside of that time frame, you must be what we call pre-Clovis. And Clovis first people adherents of the Clovis first hypothesis don't want to talk to anyone who believes in pre-Clovis. So there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with your dates. There's something wrong with the science that what you're doing to, to fathom that something could could be here prior to Clovis. So this idea, if we date to before 13.2 thousand years ago, requires really good evidence from strong stratigraphic control, undisturbed. Um, we would want artifacts associated with these dates that were absolutely the product of human manufacture. And we'd want uh, radioisotope dates, radiocarbon dates on organic materials that are well-preserved and uncontaminated in direct association with these artifacts. So these are fairly tall order, like the perfect solution, right? That if you can find these things. So we're now dealing with, you know, a North American continent that's or oriented in a fairly straightforward way. Um, we've got inland versus coastal route, but we want to sort of see if we can go a little ahead of that 13.2. Now, a few years ago, someone pushed it a little beyond the realm of possibility. And um, I forget the date when this paper came out, um, might have been 2015, 2016. Um, but it's called the Cerruti Mastodon site in San Diego, near San Diego. And they claim that these broken bones of mastodon and these broken fragments of rock are a product of the first humans in North America. And, and routinely, most people just clearly dismissed it. It got published in Science, 
but that doesn't mean someone wasn't asleep at the wheel, right? It, 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 things happen. And, um, for whatever reason, they, it got published. Um, but there's been no, um, uh, traction with this idea of 130,000 years ago, people were here. That has not won the public, uh, public's um, good grace. And it's reminiscent of Louis Leakey, who's the famous paleoanthropologist, father of, Louis, of Richard Leakey, the late Richard Leakey, who, um, you know, he, he was a bit of a dog and he uh, started going out with this woman like mary mary leakey was his wife but he started going out with another woman in california and would go visit her and like look at some rocks and then they said oh you've got a site here you know and so it, it was called calico hills and if you're driving between las vegas and los, los angeles you can go visit it and um and they claimed that they had very early modern humans in north america hundred thousand or so years ago, but that was quickly squashed as well. But there are some sites and, you know, one of the stat, one of the things I needed to do was figure out, okay, well, what I'm going to, which sites should I focus on? And I obviously, I, I focused on the ones that seem to rise to the top as the no brainers. So you don't have to read all of this, but um, here we are in Beringia in that Cordillerian coastal route uh, idea. And you'll see this uh, site of, uh, let me see, Bluefish Caves. Yeah. Um, so Bluefish Caves is here, right there. And we're going to go there. And these are some of the artifacts that are being found at some of these early sites on Beringia. And um, they're pre-Clovis. There's no Clovis associated with them. And there's extinct megafaunas that have been butchered. and um, it seems it, it's they have very early dates at about 24,000 years ago. So it seems that it supports this notion that people are living in Beringia and sustaining themselves off of this megafaunal communities in these, in these areas that are suitable for um, human habitation. Another site that's uh, slightly later, 10,000 years later, not too far away is called Swan Point. Um, again, megafauna being worked by tools that include um, microblades and other skilled uh, lithic stone technology um, that is reminiscent of cultural material culture in Siberia. And these are also um, quite compelling evidence and um, it's pre-Clovis. But by far the most impressive well-dated evidence to date is newsworthy in October last year. Um, and it's from White Sands National Park. Has any of you, have any of you heard of this, this find? It's absolutely remarkable. And um, it's a, uh, a gypsum sort of uh, sand dune deposit. And there are a series of uh, stratigraphic layers, each with different groups of, of uh, trackways, not just of human trackways, but of megafaunal trackways as well. And each of these layers has been exceptionally well excavated and dated. And one of the things in archeology span is to dig is to destroy, right? Once you dig it up, it's done. So I was watching a YouTube video on uh, talking to national park rangers here and he was almost coming to tears because, you know, as they dig these things up, they're digitizing them with 3D technology and they're creating casts with latex and doing all sorts of cool things to collect the evidence. But then erosion just takes them away once they've been exposed. So I will show you some of these things. So this is, uh, these are uh, close-ups of some of these trackways um, multiple trackways, and um, I, I, I lost one of the figures that I wanted to show you, but what we do know is that they can look at the metrics of these footprints and estimate ages of the different individuals, 
and I forget how many individuals, there may be seven or nine individuals and they're all younger children and in their teens, early teens. So they're kids playing and these fossil, these footprints are preserved. It's really like the fossil footprints from Lytoli, only much more recent. And it's as spectacular a find as those. And they've mapped them, they've digitized them, they've um, done all sorts of things. But when they first came out with their study in 1921, uh, 2021, sorry, um, they dated these, um, they dated uh, this uh, ditch, ditch grass. It, it was an aquatic plant and they radiocarbon dated the plant and people said, you can't date that. That's gonna be too old or too young. I think it was too young or uh, too old. And um, so they went back to the, they, they did science and they said, thank you for that constructive criticism. We're gonna go back and raise the bar on how we're approaching these dates. So what they did was they enlisted a, a technique called optical spin luminescence, which captures um, radiation energy in quartz grains that are buried and in, in the dark of the under buried in the ground. And you can capture the estimated time of when they last saw sunlight. And you can do so very, very accurately. Optical spin luminescence or OSL dating. So they did that. They also, um, did uh, pollen grains from trees, tree pollen that were above the footprint and right below the footprint and they radiocarbon dated those on specific footprints. And so what we have now is an updated, um, updated list of dates that are in sequence. You know, it's not like the older ones aren't on top and the younger ones aren't on the bottom. Uh, this is clear stratigraphic uh, superposition, and um, it's really shut down the critics quite well um, in, in October. Uh, really amazing material. And they also did um, sort of Bayesian analysis of these dates, uh, which is integrating a lot of different lines of evidence to ensure they have the best model for their date. And, and the take home, the headline is, these are 23 to 21,000 years old, hands down or feet down, uh, right? They're, they're real. So this is a groundbreaking, not, no pun, I'm trying not to do puns, <laughs> um, but this is really a big deal. This is as big a deal as um, finding Clovis. Now we're gonna to turn to uh, another site that I'm a little more familiar with. This is called Meadowcroft Rock Shelter in Pennsylvania. And I'm gonna sort of pick it up a little bit, but I, um, this is a really, this was a, a, a formative site for me growing up in the Northeast. And everybody was like, wow, Meadowcroft, 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 this is the best site ever until people started to poo poo this site and said, ah, oh, your, all your dates are contaminated and you're, you, you don't know what you're doing and it's a rock shelter and things get mixed up and all sorts of things. But the reality is they have good dates from around 19 and a half thousand to around the time of Clovis. So it's pre-Clovis, but all the people in the eighties and nineties and two thousands would say, nah, we don't buy that at all. But now people are coming around and saying, well, maybe these dates are somewhat close to the mark. And there's certainly a lot of interesting evidence here, but it doesn't have a lot of megafauna. There's no megafauna. And uh, there's some places where certain strata might be contaminated with groundwaters and things like that. But you don't wanna get lost in the weeds. But what we want to do is recognize that some of these sites that may have been poo-pooed years ago might be okay if, if they fit with current lines of thinking. But if we jump down to the tip of South America, and this is really interesting. This is a Tom Dillahay and a colleague working at this site of Monte Verde. And he was getting such scrutiny for his ideas that this was 14 and a half thousand years old in the southern tip of Chile that he 
I don't know where he got the money, but he flew a bunch of the like top brass archaeologists in the field down to Chile to check it out. And here they are watching and inspecting the site. So this picture, Ken Sassman was just telling me about this, this picture the other day. And uh, anyway, he was poo-pooed for this site being not real. And now we're like, wow, that's impressive. And I, there's a lot of material here. It was a waterlogged site. Um, there are evidence of, of dwellings and tent pegs and things like that from this very rich site. Um, and you can go down or up the, the, the coast of South America. There are other sites similarly with very early uh, dates, not pre-Clovis per se, but very uh, uh, different kinds of technology and adapting to maritime um, uh, foods and so forth. So a lot of interesting materials are coming out of South America. Okay, so now we want to start thinking about, okay, so now we've got North America and even South America covered, and we're before 13.2 thousand years ago. Um, what does that mean in terms of where some of this other evidence is flowing? And, and how do we start to look at um, these pulses of people that are coming into um, these new worlds and how to best date them. And they're starting to look at uh, genetic lines based on, constructed from uh, living peoples in Canada and South America. And um, they're starting to try to piece these things together. And if we look here, this is, I thought these next couple pictures are quite useful. Uh, this is a site, uh, these are, um, this is a figure uh, showing sites that are 15 and a half to 13.3 thousand years ago. So pre-Clovis and, um, and it shows how far extensive these different types of tools are um, to one another. So you have different, ah, so I'm pointing there and I should be pointing here. Um, you have different styles of stone tool projectiles that are not Clovis and yet have uh, well-dated contexts in different part of the of the North America and South America, including this pad page Ladson site in Florida and Meadowcroft here and a few other sites here that we're going to visit. And the most impressive one that I found was this site called Cooper's Ferry. And this is about 500 kilometers inland on the Columbia River. Um, and it's uh, in the Salmon River Valley. And it was discovered in the 1960s. The Napere, this is on Napere lands. They, they have oral tradition that places the origins of this, um, this site, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. Um, and Lauren Davis at Oregon State has been conducting excavations there. Uh, this is the this is the site that had the YouTube channel that had really interesting volunteers and people um, sort of talking about their work. And the evidence is absolutely mind blowing. The, how productive the site is. Here it is in orange square. Here, if we were going down the interior route between these two ice sheets, we'd be right there but it's 16,000 years old. So this would have been a block of ice. This would have been, uh, have you seen the Game of Thrones and that big wall of ice? That's what we're talking about, this massive wall. They've got uh, lots of, uh, uh, no human remains, but all the remains of act human activity, including um, uh, charcoal and pits and hearths and things like that incredible lithics that are, um, some are non-diagnostic, but show a lot of uh, use and reuse. And they've got these pits that have each have been radiocarbon dated and some upwards to 15, 16,000 years ago with 
the remains of your meals and things pushed back into the pit um, with sometimes with stone tools and broken stone tools and things like that. And um, my friend Tom Hyam did the radiocarbon dating for this site. And he's uh, he does this Bayesian analysis where they'll integrate stratigraphic information and paleoclimate information and other site-based information in with the radiocarbon dates. And they get these incredible sequence um, where these pits are dated upwards to 16,000 years ago. And Lauren Davis talks about these, uh, these stone tools from Cooper's Ferry that are very unique and different from other types of stone tools found to date. And this has led him to consider where might these be coming from? Who's inspiring these designs of these new types of stone points? And these three points here are from Hokkaido, Japan. And they are the same. They look, you wouldn't be able to distinguish them apart. And it's so cool. And when he talks about it online, you see like, wow, this is amazing what you're talking about. And so here you have um, just a, a zoom out of the Circum Pacific. And we can start to think about like the connections of Eastern Eurasian peoples coming across this Beringian land bridge, maybe hanging out for a while, maybe not, hugging the coast, coming down. And what's important about this Cooper's Ferry site and this Paisley Cave site that I'll talk about in a minute is that when they get to about here, the sea ice is gone. There's like, it's, it's a new world. They take, the, they take a left. Right. And they take a left and they go up the Columbia River and there's salmon and there's all sorts of, you know, megafaunas running around. It's like they've hit pay dirt. And so this this site, Paley, Paisley Cave, it's slightly younger than Cooper's Ferry, but um, they've actually gotten DNA that's been preserved in um, coprolites or ancient preserved poo. I know I've said poo poo a couple times today, but this is poo. And uh, <coughs> it is quite remarkable. And the, the preservation has been tricky. It's like most of it is bacteria from surrounding uh, environments and so forth. But they've been able to get exogenous human DNA from these coprolites. And in this circumstance, you know, it's, um, you know, and, it's it's hard to it's hard to get ancient DNA out of just anything, um, but out of poo, it's even harder. <clears throat> Here's another site which they were able to. Um, this is actually the earliest North American burial site uh, called Anzic. It's in Montana, and um, here just to show you. Uh, where the where Anzic is uh, found, uh, they have a clo it's a Clovis site uh, with an associated burial that dates to about twelve thousand or so years ago. So they have a date, and um, and so that's kind of secure. Now another couple of sites that I learned about, which have are fraught with their own uh, politics and everything, uh, is are, are two sites that are just a couple football fields apart from each other um, in the Buttermilk Creek area of Central Texas. And here you can see uh, there's a spring-fed river here, and um, this is a looter's pit that was um, where a lot of looter activity occurred in the 70s, uh, 60s and 70s, and then they started to purchase the land and, and get rid of those looters and uh, do proper excavations. And this has been a major, you know, if they're, you know, Cooper's Ferry and the Galt site and the Friedkin site, um, they're different. I'm gonna talk mainly about the Galt site, but they're absolutely remarkable in terms of their preservation, the stratigraphic control, the dating, and getting that secure evidence below Covis of, of good dates clear tools and so forth. So here we are in Texas, 
um, Central Texas, and you've got a lot of different kinds of lithic stone tools. You've got exceptional stratigraphy here um, from more recent to ancient. And here's the Clovis assemblage here. And then below that, most people, when they're digging Clovis sites, once you've found Clovis, you stop. We don't have to go further, right? People are starting to go further now and they're finding things below Clovis. They're finding this is Galt assemblage, it's called. It's, it's kind of waterlogged. So they had to pump water out to sort of do the work. Um, but they found incredible, um, what they would argue is diagnostic fishtail kind of um, artifacts and lithics that are pre-Clovis points. And so now they have, the, the lithics people are excited because they have clear, not just the Western stem tradition that you see in the Northwest coast and in Cooper's Ferry, but now there's this kind of another type of lithic that's happening um, 16,000 upwards to 20,000 years ago. This site was dated by um, optical spin luminescence, the OSL type of data. So we've got these pre-Clovis sites and then we've got Clovis era sites um, like these listed here. Um, and we start to see a distinct differences in stone tool technology. Um, one of the things um, that's fascinating is that Clovis is most dense in the Eastern portions of the United States, less dense in the Midwest, in, in the mid areas, and then lesser still in the Western area. This hash mark area is where the Western stem tradition seems to be uh, present. Um, but then down in South America, you have these fishtail type uh, style that extends across the entire continent, uh, not just on the coast. And I'm not even getting into some of the early uh, sort of evidence in, in the Amazon. Now, finally, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the genetics because it's an important topic. It's obviously a very um, sensitive topic to some people. Indigenous communities are not happy about ancient DNA and they don't want their ancestors analyzed without consent. And that's the current state of things in North America. Um, and yet prior to these, these I mean, these concerns have always been there, um, but I think there was this um, arrogance in, 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 in part um, by Western science, just sort of plodding forward and doing the work anyway and trying to get some answers. And so in the eighties and nineties, there was a bit of work done on mitochondrial DNA and um, and sometimes on the Y chromosome, um, building building scenarios of either single or multiple migrations into the new world. But we now are starting to tap into whole genomes, your entire genome being reconstructed through uh, genetic research. And we are, I think with the humility of science, I hope that we can actually find common ground with indigenous groups and, and start to um, do this work and, and ask good questions in responsible ways. Uh, here's David Reich, who's a colleague at Harvard and quite um, prolific. Um, you can see these are the total number of individuals he studied in his lab, and this only goes up to 2020. And you can see how productive he's been over the last um, few years, right? That is a lot of whole genomes to sort of work through. You need supercomputers that occupy buildings to sort of run those kinds of data. It's today. And um, uh, this is a good book that he's written not in the long, not too long ago. And he's and his colleagues, and he has colleagues that he works closely with and then colleagues who he doesn't work with, but they're doing kind of competing science. They're sort of both I want that Nobel Prize kind of like drive behind their research. And uh, Eric Wisselislev is also uh, in, in um, from Denmark, 
he's also been doing a lot of this kind of ancient DNA work and collaborating with native groups and native uh, teams. Anyway, what we see here is that there are multiple pulses of people coming down into this continent and into this Western hemisphere world. And we're also starting to see that you can combine the geological and the archeological and the genetic data now for the first time and start to really see um, when these um, things are, are manifest. And not to get into the weeds about these different lineages, but we're starting to ascertain different lineages and when they may have uh, appeared into the Americas. And not only that, but they're starting to look at dogs and dog DNA and, you know, dogs are arguably our best friend. And they, the earliest dog comes from about 16,000 years ago from an island off the coast of Alaska. And um, they're starting to look at the DNA of dogs. And it turns out there are two dogs that are, seem to be related to these early ancestral dogs. Uh, the Peruvian hairless dog, which I couldn't find a picture of, and I didn't, I got distracted and I couldn't find it. And then this, I don't even know how to pronounce that. Anyone? So quite a handsome dog. But so these dogs are new world dogs, if there ever were new world dogs. So I found that really interesting that um, the NIH was funding a genetic study of these dogs and how that, you know, it, that can contribute in part to unlocking this story that uh, the genetics has to tell. So when we start to think about, um, you know, how native groups were, are, are characterized, we, we have thousands of groups of people living in North and South America today, um, that claim heritage into the deep past. And we now have some data to sort of, to, to sort of uh, situate in time their appearance in, in the archeological record and in this genetic record. What is starting to, we're finding is that the geneticists are finding ghost populations. <laughs> Excuse me. So just like the Denisovans, have you guys heard about the Denisovans that are this kind of ghost population between Neanderthals and another archaic group that are found in the old world? You don't know much about them other than that they exist in geneticist labs, right? We're starting to find these ghost populations of native groups in genetics, it, through the genetics that are being conducted in on these um, materials. and. That leads me to the end of this talk, which is basically that it's they don't quite know how to, it's, it's complicated and some people would say it's really complicated, but a lot of the story gets complicated because a lot of the native indigenous people's genome was lost uh, by genocide. So, you know, when Europeans colonized the new world, and people died, so many people died that their hypothesis these days is that there was there were lineages that were just not, uh, that are just simply statistically not represented in living populations anymore. Um, and that was an eye opener for me in terms of why people are scratching their heads. And, um, and, and it just made me sort of do the full circle because, you know, here we are interested in the first Americans and yet the sadly, these first Americans, you know, are, are get lost uh, in, in, in ways that are quite violent and traumatic. And at the same time, we, we do want to sort of bring the circle full circle and, and reconstruct this as much as we can. So with that, I'm going to say thank you uh, for your attention. And I hope that was, Reasonable. That was wonderful, John. Thank you. Thank you. Just a brain overload here, um, in spite of the fact that I've been studying this for years. So, questions from the audience? Sure. Mallory. 
I've um, always wondered why, given the idea that the most of the people came from the North, uh, why the population in the South uh, seems to be not only larger, but also uh, more uh, advanced. Uh, is there something that um, would account for that? South America yes. versus North America? South America versus North America. Um, I think there's a quite a bit of diversity in terms of uh, stature or advancement or things like that. People use what tools and materials they have around them to, um, to make a living. And um, so you might have Inca civilizations and Aztec and Maya and things like that. But that doesn't necessarily mean to say that uh, a hunter-gatherer group living their way of life in central Amazon isn't, uh, you know, they're just doing things differently and they know how to get along to keep things kind of separate. We know how to live apart from one another quite well. And I think Native American groups have done that as well. They not only were they interconnected when they needed to be, they also kept their distance from one another. And then that comes into the gene flow and genetic drift or not, no genetic uh, flow, right? So some people are maintaining their genetic populations and genetic uh, integrity intact just because there's more, there's just less gene flow. But I do understand, I, I think that it's pretty heterogeneous in terms of this, um, of both North America and South America. And we also know that uh, we also know that um, there have been on what human remains there are. Uh, I didn't want to show images of human remains in this talk, but what studies have been done on human remains themselves have shown that sometimes they seem to be like, oh, maybe these people are from Europe instead, or maybe these people are a different wave of people, and. Um, those have always been um, less compelling to the morphologists that have studied those materials. It's just, there's, there's too much, it's quite a bit of mix. Yes. Yeah. Uh, wait, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, Bob, uh, sorry. Bob, go ahead. Uh, Bob Bernstein. Uh, I'm puzzled a little bit, not by your talk, which I thought was excellent, but South America is a really long way from Asia. It's a lot closer to Africa, uh, sort of the Congo area. And there's a South Equatorial current that comes from Africa to South America. It's is there really no interesting evidence or that. has anybody looked? You know, and I, I found one image. There was one figure that I was, I might have included in the talk, but I might not have. And it had an arrow from Africa to South America drawn that way saying, oh, maybe they came this way. Um, but, you know, none of, through none of my sort of literature review on this sort of the new, the newest discoveries, have, were they really talking about that African connection? And the genetics don't support it at all. So the genetics do support something that's really interesting. And it's not only these ghost populations, but South Americans, um, certain populations in South America have some Australomelanesian type of genetic markers in their genome that other Native American groups maybe don't have. And so they, there's this idea that maybe, just maybe, these are the Australomelanesians, like um, Andaman Islander type genes that may have been in the mix as certain Eurasian populations were organizing and getting and, and moving across the Bering Land Bridge? Or did they maybe cross from the Pacific into South America? And that's a whole nother level, that's a whole nother talk about the connections between uh, the islands off of Chile and the Pacific. That's another really interesting story. But, wow. but I take your point about that. Back. We're going deep. A little puzzling as well. This lady over here. Don't forget to stay in front of your mic. Okay. Um, more another question? Let me see. Um, John, you didn't mention it, so I would imagine that it doesn't exist or at least hasn't been found yet. But in the old world, there are 
fertility figures that have been found, is there anything at all similar other than, let's say, rock art that might be like that in the New World? Um, that in my you know, in terms of the uh, fertility, I'm not aware of that. But what one of the things I've learned is some of these child burials that were that have been excavated in um, in Alaska are, I mean, in child burials just break your heart, right? They're just they're they're very compelling. There, there's a lot to learn about them and how they can sort of contribute to the story. Um, they're found with toys, and so they're archaeologists or at least are interpreting some of these these artifacts. They're not ceramic, they're lithic, but they are preserved, forged little toys that are buried with the thing. But I not I don't know anything about the um, uh, in terms of a fertility type of artifact. Oh, I think that in terms of religious worldview, the um, there are burials that clearly show uh, uh, a pretty compelling worldview in terms of use of red ochre, rich, rich use of red ochre, um, how they're placed by, side by side, um, grave inclusions, um, things like that are, are quite compelling. Um, yeah. The, the use of, the use of, the, the, wait. That would be, that would be in Clovis era and, um, and after, yeah. The, the use of ochre is worldwide. In, Red in ochre is grades. one of those global phenomena that represents life. And um, I've worked on burials in Southeast Asia, and um, it's always moving when you find this. It's so, uh, it's such a rich, deep red hue. Uh, it's it's really powerful. Even the Neanderthals yeah. are red. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have a question yeah. on Zoom. Uh, Paul Parker, if you can unmute. Can you unmute, Paul? Paul, you're muted. Yeah, well, OK. Um, more questions from the audience in the room? Well, you've answered. Wait a minute, I got it. There, there we go, Paul. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. This was just fascinating. And thank you, Julie, for getting me back on. Um, I, I've always been curious to what extent the glaciation that created the land branch and was um, land uh, uh, formations that allowed people to migrate, whether they did not extend to Europe and to Northern Europe to the extent that, or maybe in the period around 16,000 years or in that period, did not enable European groups to uh, migrate to North America. And periodically you hear about Clovis uh, uh, being found in, in uh, sites, and as you indicated in Pennsylvania, and that there may have also been abilities of people in Europe as well as Africa, quite able to use water transportation to go amazing dis distances. I'm really glad you asked that question, thank you. Um, there are actually arguments for Salutrian related, Salutrian being one classified type of stone point, um, from Salutrian inspired lithics in, that some people see uh, in lithics in Eastern North America. And they argue sometimes vociferously for a European connection through the, through, um, and it's through a similar, I would imagine, a similar type of means, uh, hugging coastlines and ice, ice corridors and whatnot. Right, right. Along the um, Greenland and and that area into uh, northern Labrador and things like that. Um, I'm. Uh, you'll have to ask Ken next year, next uh, time he comes. I think he's the next speaker. Uh, he knows a little bit more about that Salutrian hypothesis, but. I don't think it's you can rule it out necessarily. It's just that the evidence, as it stands, far supports this, um, you know, from the east, west. Yeah, no, no DNA evidence then. There's no DNA evidence, uh, okay. not at all. Interesting. Okay, 
Uh, any further questions? Well, thank you so much for coming and thank, thank you, you, John. Thank you all. Great job. Thank you, Phyllis. That was great.